Welcome to our virtual event series featuring um, Porchlight Book Company and Basel Book Company. We are so honored to be part of this and to introduce our author uh, is Sally Halderson, managing part, uh, manager of uh, Porchlight Book Company. Um, thank you so much uh, for joining us and um, I will disappear now. <laughs> thank you, Daniel. And um, welcome to Susan Kane. I am so excited. And if there was ever a time we needed Susan Kane's latest book, The Time Is Now. So let me set up a little backstory on Susan before we um, yield the floor to her. Um, Susan started what has been named the Quiet Movement with her book, Quiet, The Power of Introverts in a World That Can't Stop Talking which revolutionized how the world sees introverts and how introverts see themselves. Over the years, that book has had an enormous impact on the workplace, specifically in reimagining introverts as equally valuable, though often differently skilled from their extroverted peers. Um, her latest book, Bittersweet, How Sorrow and Longing Make Us Whole, works in a similar way by distinguishing and elevating those of us who have a bittersweet outlook mm. on life, those who carry the light and the dark with them, when the predominant message of our culture trumpets the, posit the power of positivity. I'm sure there are many of you in attendance who are already nodding your heads, recognizing yourselves, and it won't be the only time as we talk with Susan. And if you have any questions for Susan that can bring, we can bring into the conversation toward the end of the hour, please go ahead and share those in chat. And um, Susan, I'm very honored to be talking with you this morning. On the top shelf of my bookcase here at work, I have featured some of the books that have influenced me most as a manager and really as a human. And your book, Quiet, stands side by side with Brene Brown's Rising Strong, um, two books that have changed the way that I bring my whole self to work and um, present myself in life. Um, as an aspirational introvert, quiet was really um, important to me, and bittersweet spoke to me the entire time that I was reading it and listening to the audiobook and um, listening to your voice um, tell me this story that you so beautifully have written. Um, so let's spend a little time with your um, beautifully written and enlightening book, Bittersweet. Thank you for being here. Thank you for writing this book. Well, Sally, thank you so much for that incredible introduction. And I'm honored to be up there on your shelf alongside my dear friend, Brene. And so great to be here with you. And also I wanna say a big thanks to Daniel for his introduction. Um, yeah, and I'm excited to get started. I am going, I'm trying to fix my, I have you in a little corner here, but it's gonna work. Technology, <laughs> we've already discussed the challenges, right? Um, I think that the, um, I have so many things that I would like to talk to you about this book, um, that this could be a multi-hour conversation. And I know you have, a, you have a very busy schedule as do our attendees. So let's dive right in and um, start where you started. And that is with um, how the mournful music of Leonard Cohen started you on a decades long quest to answer one rather simple question. Why did you enjoy listening to melancholy music and ended with you writing this book about something far less simple of sorrow and longing and our human experience? Yeah, so I mean, um, well, in the book, I tell the story of how, well, before I became a writer, I was a lawyer, which was like a whole kind of crazy detour in my life. Um, but I tell the story in the book about how when I was in law school, um, in my law school dorm first year, some friends were kind of swinging by my dorm room to pick me up for class. And they arrived in my dorm room to find me listening to, um, or I should say blasting from my stereo speakers, <laughs> <laughs> um, sad music. It was probably Leonard Cohen. I, I don't know who it was, but right. someone like that. And, um, and, and my friends were like, like they thought it was really funny that I was listening to that music. And one of them asked me why I was listening to funeral music. And at the time I just laughed, like the way he said it was really funny. And I laughed and we went to class and that was the end of it except that it, it 
ignited in me this question of what it was about that music that I loved so much and what it was about our culture that made it vaguely embarrassing to be listening to it, except in very like narrowly circumscribed moments. And, you know, there's sort of an idea that you should be listening kind of in private at specific right. times of the day. Um, so what, what, what was that? And, and why was it that music like that made me feel not sad at all, actually, but instead feel kind of uplifted and connected to, um, to humanity. And I would feel like kind of a wash and gratitude to the musician and in love for all the humanity that had known the sorrow that the music was trying to express. I felt all these things. I just wanted to know the answer to that question, but in trying to answer that question, and we could talk about what sad music really is, but in, in trying to answer that question, I realized that there was there is this centuries old tradition in all our religions, in our literary tradition, our art, our music, um, of artists, of theologians, now of psychologists, all trying to tell us that this bittersweet experience that all humans have to know, because life is for all of us, some sort of mix of joy and sorrow, that this bittersweetness is one of the most direct roots we have to creativity and connection and transcendence. And this bittersweet tradition that we all have access to, we've all inherited it, it's glorious. And our culture doesn't talk about it because you know we're so we're so meant to only focus on what's supposedly positive that we're actually overlooking this other incredibly deeply positive tradition. It's just positive in a in a very different way. There are so many avenues to go down to go down. We could start talking about our winners and losers culture. We can start talking about um, how longing breaks us open. I've got so many things. So um, I think what that represents is the fact that I, I found this book to be such a richly textured and layered reading experience. The scope of your resources and references is so vast. Um, you include academic research, case studies, spiritual philosophers and religious leaders, management theorists and business leaders, poetry, music, as well as weaving in elements of memoir um, and creative nonfiction, as it were. Um, the, substant the substantive can't talk, content makes bittersweet, which one might think of as being sort of an elusive or ephemeral concept, mm -hmm. very tangible. And so I'm wondering how, um, since that first question when you were in college, which I think um, could be also asked, why am I the way I am? Yeah. How did that uh, develop into this book that is just so wide ranging and yet um, redefines a word bittersweet that we may not be accustomed to thinking as our own? Yeah, it's a really good question because the challenge of writing this book was kind of embedded in the question you just asked, which is, um, it felt this, this concept of bittersweetness felt to me like simultaneously the most real thing in the world and also the okay. most ineffable. And if something is ineffable by definition, it's therefore hard to render it in words. Um, and so, but, but I guess I did what I had done with quiet, which is like, I, my process seems to be that I get consumed by a question or like something that I'm, you know, burning to express. Um, and then I just sort of walk around the world for a few years, looking at everything through that question. So, mm -hmm. you know, everything I read for years, every conversation I had, um, I, I, I took all these different trips. Like I, I immersed myself in different religious traditions in um, like the psychology of bereavement, um, I went back to my college to interview students about what they were really feeling underneath the shiny surfaces that they all presented. Um, I went to talk to Pete Doctor, the director at Pixar, who had produced the amazing movie Inside Out, which, which actually um, made sadness, like a, an embodied version of sadness, the, mm -hmm. the central character of the movie. Um, so I guess I just, I, I did my usual process of just kind of looking at everything um, through this lens. And, and then the, and, and, and then I realized how 
how many embodiments there actually were of this supposedly ineffable concept of bittersweetness. But the real challenge was in like, how the heck do you um, weave all of that into a coherent narrative? And that mm -hmm. took me some years to figure out. It is, um, I think, the image of it being weaved together is, is such an apt one. It really is, um, in my reading of the book and trying to, um, I would follow one thread and realize that you had brought it all the way back from the beginning and, and through to the end. And yet there were so many different layers to take it. It's really, it's a phenomenal experience um, reading the book. And I hope that everyone here gets a chance to read it. Um, and I think that one of the things that that brings our uh, participants here today, um, and as well as other readers to the book, is a feeling of resonance with the word bittersweet. Um, but can you walk us through a little bit how what defines the bittersweet temperament, how we are I sort of reimagine what that is and how that can inform how we live our lives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so in a second, I'll actually... Well, as you know, I, I developed um, together with with two friends of mine who are great psychologists, Scott Barry Kaufman and David Yaden. Um, together, we we developed this bittersweet quiz that people can take to um, assess where they feel they fall on, or or to to assess how prone they are to states of bittersweetness. So, in a second, I'll walk people through a few questions from that quiz to mm -hmm. to give you all listening yeah. a sense um, of it. But, but first, just to define kind of what I mean by bittersweetness, um, it is, as you were just saying, it's, it's kind of like a, an intense awareness of the fact that um, life involves a kind of pairing of light and dark and joy and sorrow and bitter and sweet, mm -hmm. um, and, that, and that life is inherently impermanent so that the, everything that we love most deeply will not be here forever. Um, but that what comes along with that realization is this kind of intensely piercing joy at the beauty of everything. Um, like C.S. Lewis called uh, joy stabs of longing. Um, and, and so it's, that's the kind of emotion it is, but to, to now sort of bring it down into, um, let's say everyday terms, um, some of the questions from the quiz are things like, do you react intensely to art, music, or nature? Um, do you draw comfort or inspiration from a rainy day? Um, do you, have, have others called you an old soul? Uh, do, do you find yourself getting goosebumps several times a day? Um, and, and in general, the more you answer yes to these kinds of questions, the more prone you are to this state of bittersweetness. Um, and then what's really interesting beyond that, uh, we, 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 we looked to figure out for people who are prone to bittersweetness, what are their other characteristics? Mm -hmm. And what we found is that people who are high in this bittersweet state, meaning they're, they're prone to this state of mind, um, they also tend to be high in, well, the trait that Elaine, Ar the psychologist Elaine Aaron calls high sensitivity which means kind of like a sensitivity to everything, the good mm -hmm. and the bad, you know, whatever is happening to you, you're reacting that much more intensely to it right. than your typical person. Um, also, what comes along with bittersweetness is a tendency to states of awe and wonder and spirituality and transcendence. Um, and then also a tendency to a state called absorption, which predicts creativity. And this was really interesting because I, I did this whole chapter in the book, as you know, about the connections between bittersweetness and creativity. Yeah. And I wrote that whole chapter before we had the results of this quiz. Mm -hmm. um, so it was like all the research was pointing to this connection between bittersweetness and creativity, but I had no idea whether the, the data that we were gathering was going to back that up. Um, and in fact, it did in the end. I, as I read the book, I felt like, as you know, we do when we connect deeply with a book and where we feel a sense of kindred spirits or, or an enlightenment of sorts into ourselves, see ourselves reflected back to us. And I know that I felt very much like this was a book that I wish that I could go back in time and give to my 10 year old self 
give to my 20 year old self, my 30 year old self. I feel now that um, I am where I am in at my age that I have learned a little bit of something that you write to way to the end of the book about um, how do you hold melancholy in your hand or how do you hold melancholy in your life? And I think that for most of my life, I didn't know how to do that. Mm -hmm. I thought I wasn't supposed to. I thought that I was supposed to push it away and give it away. Um, even as I took some amount of um, pride in my sensitivity or you know, people connected to me because I could, I could visit them on that level when they wanted to visit the melancholy or the bittersweet. And I think that um, what this book does for people is much, as I've said in the introduction, um, does what quiet did for people who also didn't trust themselves as introverts mm -hmm. and to learn a trust in themselves as um, someone who has this bittersweet um, temperament and that it isn't something um, that in contrast to our culture that is very positive focused that um, we those of us who experience aren't less than and can adapt and create um, strategies and skills for for implementing how we live it in our lives and how did you feel that through all of this research that you have you changed the way that you commune with your own bittersweetness um, I don't know if I've changed the way I commune with it because for whatever reason, I think I've always had, um, a deep feeling that whatever powers I happen to have, and that, you know, I, I have the feeling that all humans are born with their own particular powers and, and that mm -hmm. the ones that I happen to have been granted, um, I somehow felt that they were connected to whatever that thing was in me that, I'm now calling bittersweetness. Um, so I don't know that it's changed for me, but what I can say is the most amazing thing about writing a book like this. And I had the same exact experience with quiet, you know, you write something like this. And by definition, if you're writing about something that people aren't talking about much or don't talk about in a positive light, you have, you don't really know how many other people out there are experiencing the same thing. It's almost mm -hmm. like a feeling of, um, you know, writing a message in a bottle and sending it out into the waves yeah. and hoping that other people will find the bottle and read the message. So like when I first started writing quiet, truly, I thought I was working on this weird and idiosyncratic project that was a little embarrassing to talk about. Um, and, you know, and then you, you discover, oh my gosh, you know, half the population feels this way. So the same thing is happening now with bittersweet, like where I'm getting these letters from people who are like, oh my gosh, this is this thing I've been feeling all my life. And I cannot tell you how intensely, deeply gratifying it is to hear from people saying this and to hear other people putting in their own words, this thing that I've been trying to express for my whole life. Um, you know, like what I, I got this incredible letter from a guy, he's a filmmaker in LA and, and he talked about how he'd grown up in, in New York city and all his life. He'd, he would like, well, I guess as a teenager, he would, he would be walking along the city streets at night, coming back from a party or an event. And he would listen to that same kind of music that I was listening to that day in my dorm. And he said the feeling would come over him and he didn't know how to describe it. He always called it, quote, that holy feeling. Oh, that's beautiful. Yeah, yeah. And 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 he too, as, as you were suggesting in your question, had gotten the sense that there was something, that there was something dangerous or shameful in feelings connected to melancholy. So he had been mm -hmm. like trying to push it down even though there was something in him that knew that it was a source of, of depth and power. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, you know, to connect with people, naming that experience to me is just the most intense joy. Um, and then also like one of my great wishes from this book is to reach out to the world of mainstream psychology, which right now, 
does not have a language for distinguishing mm-hmm. between melancholy and depression, right. even though the, these really are completely different states. Um, you know, like clinical depression is awful. There's no creativity that comes from it. It's, mm-hmm. it's, it's misery, it's emotional numbness, it's an emotional black hole. Um, that's very different from this state of being connected to the joys and sorrows of the world. And yet, if you like, if you, you know, roam around in psychology databases the way that I do, and you, you, you put melancholy into your search mm-hmm. terms, all you get is articles about clinical depression. So it's like this whole realm of human experience Yep. Not being adequately studied or, or talked about. There are a few things in what you just said that um, I'm going to go all over the map here, but when you were yeah, talking sure. at the beginning, when you were talking about that, you believe that we are all born with powers. And that reminded me of, I noted the quote, the section in here, you're um, referencing Tim Chang, who mm-hmm. is a venture capitalist and um You quoted him saying greatness, he or this is a quote from you, greatness, he told me often comes from developing a superpower that adapts to the blow that almost killed you. Mm -hmm. And I get chills just reading that. Um, And then you also write, remember the linguistic origins of the word yearning, the place you suffer is the place you care. Therefore, the best response to pain is to dive deeper into your caring. And um, so two things I think here. Um, what can we learn from harnessing our trauma or accessing our superpower um, through that thing? And here, I'll, I'll leave it at that. And then I'll ask my next question after. Yeah, after sure. That one. I mean, there's, um, there's a kind of um, a discipline in psychology called acceptance and commitment therapy. It was, um, that term was coined and, and this field was invented by a guy named Stephen Hayes. Um, and the basic idea is when something difficult happens to you or when you're grappling with, with negative emotions, difficult experiences, um, you know, number one, to accept, to accept it, not to try to like push it away, but to accept what you're feeling and grant that it's okay to be feeling the way that you are. Um, but the, that's the acceptance part, but the commitment part of acceptance and commitment therapy is to realize that if you're feeling that much pain, it's because something has happened in a realm of your life where you care, especially deeply, <clears throat> excuse me. So like, if you're, if you're really upset about a lost love, it's telling you that love really matters to you, or, you know, that the kind of relationship that you've just lost really matters to you. And, and then you ask yourself, well, what can I do with this realm that matters so much to me? Um, and, and, and how can I dive into that realm that matter? Like, how can I commit myself to, to that particular realm? Um, and, and so in the book, I tell a lot of stories of different people who have done exactly that. Um, and one kind of arch- archetypal line that we have, um, in our heritage is the idea of the wounded healer, um, which, which dates all the way back to Greek mythology, you know, where we had, um, figures who had been, who'd been wounded like physically in these tales, but, and then as a result of those wounds were granted the power to heal others, um, who suffered from the same or similar wounds. And you see people doing this all the time, right? It's like, um, you know, a, 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 a woman loses a beloved child to a drunk driver and then starts an organization called Mothers Against Drunk Driving. Um, you know, or, or the collective response that we have, like after 9-11, um, mm-hmm. there were suddenly a surge of applications of people to become firefighters or even to sign up for Teach of America, like the, the application yeah. shot up in, in the wake of that event. So there's something about like, we sustain some kind of wound and it And there's just a natural response to seek meaning and to try to cure future wounds of the same kind. And that's a very, not just empowering, it's a very, uh, it's a very elevating response to, to the pains that, that we have to endure. And I, 
it's not to say I, I don't want in any way to like minimize the force of those pains or to say that all pains can be, um, can be healed exactly. But just to turn ourselves in the direction of trying to transform pain into beauty. Um, also, I just, I, I want to say it's not, it's also not to say that the mandate is that anybody who suffered a pain of some kind should now like go create a worldwide organization. Right. Like it doesn't have to be on such a grand scale. You know, it can be in very small and, and daily acts that we take. Even if it's self-care for ourselves, Even I think. If and um, in one of my notes, I wrote that this reading this book was a self-care act that I didn't know I needed. Mm. And it feels a bit that writing it may have been a self-care act that that you needed um yeah. you uh, share your own personal stories among the stories of of all of the other folks that you feature in the book and um your relationship with your mother your relationship with yourself and um i think that that brings in a sense of not only this sounds a bit clinical but application Mm -hmm. for us, but also that um, this was a deeply personal experience. And um, I think early on, you tell a story about um, when you were in a writing class and you were trying to write about your relationship with your mother. And um, I think you wrote a fiction piece and your, and your uh, instructor told you to put it away for 30 years. Yeah. And so now here we are 30 years later and you have this piece that, um, that includes that story and that that feels like do you feel like that's a full circle like that this is the book that you were meant to write yeah very much so um and i guess i won't go into the whole story of what happened with my mother here though um as you say i i i tell it in the book um but but one aspect of the story is that well we we, we had a very um wonderful and then difficult and then relationship that ended in a kind of redemptive uh, moment in time you could say but but for decades because of this difficulty for decades I could not speak about my mother without crying like I couldn't as I write in the book I couldn't say a simple thing like answer a question like where'd your mother grow up she grew up in Brooklyn I like I couldn't say something as straightforward as that without crying um and uh and I was actually worried about and I knew I was writing the story in this book and, and so I was worried about what was going to happen when I went out on the book tour and I thought well what if people ask me about about that story um you know and I'm on air with lots of people listening and what if I just like lose it right. and even though I'm I, I'm not averse to people crying in public, I, I didn't really want to be, you know, so at the mercy of emotions that I just couldn't control at all mm -hmm. like that. And anyway, um, really the most miraculous thing happened, which is that as, as you intuit, just through the act of writing this book, all of that became settled for me. And that's no longer an issue. Um, and, and, you know, I, I guess I had heard before about the idea that writing can be this grand act of catharsis. But I, I guess I would have thought of that as like one of those pat things that people say that can't possibly mm -hmm. be really, really true. Um, but it was really, really true. Like, yeah. 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 Um, there is, and, and that's one of the great paradoxes. There is something about being willing to go to the place where joy and sorrow meet that is actually healing as opposed to what our culture tells us, which is that, you know, it would drag you down to be mm -hmm. looking at sorrow in the full in the face, you know, that it would be like a Medusa that would turn you to stone, mm -hmm. but that's not actually how it works. I think that's very true. I, I just want to add, there is um, a principle that you share in the book that speaks to what you just um, um, explained about sort of the writing as catharsis or um, you say, whatever pain you can't get rid of, make it your creative offering. And I think that that is, as readers, that's what we will experience through reading Bittersweet and um, following the that path that you took as well. And I think that that can do that for those of us who will then read it. Uh, because I think you also then say, or find someone that 
um, can do it for you, I think is the rest of that, that um, phrase. Um, so I want to talk for a second about Wait, can uh, I just interrupt you oh, for yeah, one second? Because um, yes, I, I do say that and really, and really mean it. And mean but it, I just want, right. I just want to, um, yeah, I just want to kind of like hasten to add that doesn't mean mm -hmm. that you have to go and write a whole book right. because that like, you know, that takes years. Um, so there are much simpler ways to do it, you know, and for some people it's like cooking dinner for their family yeah. or, yeah. Um, or as you said, find someone to do it for you. There's all this amazing research that shows that it's not only the act of creating art, but just the act of immersing yourself in it or engaging with art as the so-called consumer of it, um, that in and of itself is incredibly healing. So, so it's more like a matter of just immersing yourself in whatever realm of creativity speaks to you personally. And again, it can be small. Um, and one of the things that I did as I was writing this book is, um, I started following all these art accounts on Twitter mm -hmm. um, and until my feed was full of art. And then when that happened, and I, I did this because I had fallen into this black hole of doom scrolling Twitter every morning during the pandemic. Um, yeah. and, and that was no good. So, but once I had this feed full of art, I started curating. So every day I would begin my writing morning by um, picking a favorite piece of art and then pairing it with a poem or a quotation that I thought went well with it and putting that up on my social channels. Mm -hmm. And, and then all these other people who loved that came. To, and so it felt like this community of people who were all bonded around this beauty. And, um, and you could say that that was a kind of inefficient way to start my writing day because it took like an hour every morning to do this but it really put me into such a generative and peaceful frame of mind. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's what immersing in a realm of creativity can do for us. I, there are a couple of, um, I want to talk about the word longing. Yeah. And um, the, you know, on the subtitle, the subtitle of the book is how sorrow and longing make us whole. Um, and you, talk about you um, elucidate longing for us in a way that I think is really important, an important distinction to make for people. I can imagine that even though those of us in attendance today and those of us um, drawn to your book are already there, you know, we're already embracing our bittersweet. But I think that there are also people who are um, more comfortable with the culture of pushing that away, getting mm -hmm. over your grief, um, not wallowing in negative, in what is presumed as negative thoughts, um, that there's a distinction to be made about longing being a passive, um, indulgent act, and that it is actually, maybe that's not, act is not even a right word to say there, but that um, longing is actually an active force that drives us to whatever aspiration it is that we have, that it, yeah. it is the thing that keeps us moving toward the vision of, um, or the pursuit of that which we don't have and that which we long for. Yeah. And that that's really critical for people to be open, have an open cup when they come to this idea of bittersweet and how the longing can work in a person. Yeah, I mean, exactly. And, and we all know this, we all know the state of longing instinctively, even though we don't label it that, but you know, those, those moments that you have when you're at a concert and you're suddenly moved beyond what you could express, or, you know, you're watching an Olympian mm -hmm. or an incredible tennis player, or whoever, and you're like, how, how the heck do they do that? And it's like, they, it, it feels as if at that moment they have descended to this earth from, you know, some, some higher, better place. And they're expressing for us everything that, that we're yearning for. Um, and this idea of longing, and, and as you say, you're right, like in our culture, um, longing is associated with like you're mired in longing and it's something that 
would keep you stuck in the ground, like a kind of emotional quicksand. Um, but historically, it, that is not how it's been understood. Like the very etymology of the word longing literally means to grow longer, like to reach for. So it's, it's reaching for that which you would want to attain. Um, all of our religions tell mm-hmm. us this, like we're longing for the Garden of Eden. We're longing for Mecca. We're longing for Zion. Um, my favorite version of it, the, the, the poet Rumi, the um, uh, Jalaluddin Rumi, who's the 12th century Sufi poet, he, Su- Sufism is basically the mystical version of Islam. Mm-hmm. And the, the whole heart of, of Sufism and of most mystical traditions is the idea that you long for the divine and the very act of longing for the divine is the act that's going to bring you that much closer. So the longing is, is, the, re- is the union itself. The longing is how you get to the union. It's a, it's a kind of internal paradox that we've completely lost touch with. But um, I think for what, to kind of, what we're longing, when we experience that kind of spiritual longing, and, and I'm using these spiritual mm-hmm. terms, but I mean this to apply to atheists and believers alike. Right. Um, it's, basically, it's basically talking about the inner human longing for everything that is love that is true that is beautiful that is perfection all of which will remain eternally elusive and yet the act of longing for it is what brings us closer and what brings us to our most creative selves can let's take that one step further with an another um quote from the book where you write that um I'm going to paraphrase a little bit that the secret our poets and philosophers have been trying to tell us all along is that longing is the great gateway to belonging. Can you um, walk us through that and and how um, that happens? Yeah, sure. I mean, I'll I'll tell you first about like, I'll give you some examples of how we're all actually immersed in this message and don't even realize it. And then I'll tell you like a story from my own life. Um, the ways in which we don't even realize it, you know, look at all our children's literature, like Harry Potter, or Pippi Longstocking. Um, why is it, why is it that so many of these protagonists are orphans? Um, and we just kind of accept that as like the catalyst that gets the story going, but it's like, basically what these writers have been telling us for such a long time is that there's something about this act or or this condition of, of brokenness and yearning for a reunion in this case with the parents, that is what gets the epic adventure in motion. Um, You know, same thing with Homer's Odyssey. Like we think of it as a story of epic adventure, which it is, but it begins with Odysseus who Mm. is, who's weeping with homesickness for his native land of Ithaca. Like the poem starts with him weeping on a beach, longing for home. Um, That has always been the great human catalyst. Like we come into this world longing for home. We come into this world in tears. And whether you interpret that psychoanalytically as longing for the womb that we've just had to exit, or you interpret it in theological terms, kind of doesn't matter. (laughs) That's Mm -hmm. our psyche. Um, so in my own life, like one way that this played out is that I spent all those years as a corporate lawyer. Um, and it's a whole story of how I left corporate law, but basically like in one fell swoop, when I was in my early thirties, I left my career, um, left a seven year relationship that had always felt wrong, um, left the apartment in which I had been living. And so I was suddenly in this state of free fall with like no career, no relationship, no place to live. Um, And I immediately fell into a relationship with a guy. I'd wanted to be a writer. I should say first, I had wanted to be a writer my whole life and but had been off on this great detour of being a lawyer. Um, And I suddenly fell into a relationship with this guy who was um, a lyricist and a musician. And it became one of these obsessive relationships that I just could not extricate myself from. I couldn't do it. 
and 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 I would regale my a, a friend of mine, a friend Naomi, um, with you know like incessant tales of this guy I was obsessed with, and she listened patiently to me day after day, until one day she said to me, "If you're this obsessed, it's because he represents something you're longing for. So what are you longing for?" And just the act of her asking that question, I instantly understood that. That, that this obsession, this, this guy represented to me the world of art and writing that I had always wanted to be a part of my whole life and had been on this big detour. Um, and he was a kind of like emissary from that more perfect world, what, what felt to me like that more perfect world. And immediately with that realization, the obsession completely melted away. I never had it again. Um, and I started writing for real. And, and I think that that's a question that we should all ask ourselves, you know, if you're longing for a specific piece of real estate or, or whatever it is in your life, what does it actually represent to you? And what direction is it pointing to you to go in? That's really the question. I have a note here that says that I want to stress to um, all readers of the book that they must read through to the coda, because I think that the questions that you pose to us um, following this story that that you tell at the end there um, is our first step to engage in that um, recognition of home and how and whatever that is in terms of a literal or figurative sense for us um, that those questions can bring us closer to that feeling um, of home that that which we seek and long for. Um, I want to quickly, um, because I know quiet was very influential for a lot of people in the workplace, I want to visit um, sort of the greater span out from the personal here for a moment and talk yeah. a little bit about um, both the greater cultural and also our work culture, and how um, bittersweet play, recognizing the bittersweet plays a role in what we bring to work, but, and what kind of workplaces people are welcome in, but also then how our greater culture um, deems that to be um, maybe soft skills or mm -hmm. something that is um, less ambitious and less accomplished than, um, what we val deem valuable. Yeah, yeah. Well, There's a lot I, in there. That's a big question. <laughs> no, I totally get it. Um, and I guess what I'd say, <clears throat> excuse me, the, um, the bad news is that our work culture still has, <clears throat> excuse me, still has a long way to go um, in terms of allowing us to bring our full emotional landscape to the world of work. Um, you could say that sorrow is the last great taboo in the workplace. It's, it's the one, the one thing you're really not supposed to talk about. Um, you can, you, you can talk about it again in very limited and narrow lanes. Like if you've just, you know, if, if you've had a death in the, in the immediate family, you're allowed to feel sad for a certain mm -hmm. amount of time publicly at work, but there's this whole, um, constellation of griefs that the psychologist Kenneth Doga calls disenfranchised griefs. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the ones that are less socially acceptable to talk about that, that are still really off limits. Um, and in fact, there's this one really incredible project um, done by a, a psychologist named, or two, uh, Jason Kanoff and Laura Madden. And they, they conducted all these interviews with people at work um, and just asked them about their experiences. And they found that people would describe, they would give them accounts of all these like, terrible and upsetting things that had happened to them at their workplaces. Mm -hmm. But when asked to label the emotions that they felt about those experiences, they may have been anxious, but they would describe themselves as feeling angry or like they were really sad and upset or, and they would describe themselves as feeling frustrated. Mm -hmm. So there's this automatic editing that we do of our own emotional landscape where we like 
tamp down anything that speaks of loss and sorrow because it's just not allowed. Okay, so that's the bad news. <laughs> the, the good news is that things are starting to change slowly but surely. Um, it was actually Jason Kanoff who, who pointed this out to me that ever since he said it was around 9-11 was when this changed, um, Harvard Business Review started to run more and more articles about the virtues of compassionate leadership and like focusing on, on compassion in the workplace. And increasingly, it is being understood that that plays a role. And what does compassion have to do with all this? Well, compa- the very word compassion means like with, with suffering, with sorrow. You know, so it means like engaging with other people's expressions of distress. Um, and there are case studies that have been done that have shown that have shown the virtues of having a culture of compassion in a workplace. Um, and how it's actually really good for the bottom line as well as for people's souls. So I would say things are changing slowly but surely, but we, we as with all things, it takes a while. I have um, what, what I think is so, um, what connects many of the, the, the points that you're making is that um, we don't have to live with dichotomies mm-hmm. and that in even in looking at bitter and sweet um that it is bittersweet it is both things mm-hmm. and um there is a section i was just looking for my note and i'm not going to be able to find it but let's see if i can i can recreate it that there's a section in um when you're talking about business in the workplace and compassion in the workplace as being the solution that it is because of all of the things that we value. And one of them is innovation, that with inno- innovation holds hands with failure. And there's a list that there are a number of these um, things that we value that hold hands with something that we um, are less comfortable with mm-hmm. as, as a result. And we have to make a peace with the fact that um, these aspirational qualities also come with some element of sorrow or sadness or disappointment. Yeah. And that that's, I think, um, I'm going to put that note next to my desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's right. And it's like, I mean, would we wish that the world weren't that way? Probably most of us would. And if we could wave a magic wand and wave away, our sorrows, we would probably do it Um, and wave away other people's sorrows. We would probably do it. But the idea is that that's not the world we have. And that in the world that we have, there are better and worse ways to engage with the fact that sorrow is part of life Um, and to understand that it, it does happen to be a wellspring of creativity. And it also happens to be a wellspring of connection of human connection. Um, and we know this, like the, the psychologist Dacher Keltner did these amazing studies where he, um, he was studying what he called the compassionate instinct. And he found, for example, that we all have a vagus nerve, which is the biggest bundle of nerves in our bodies. And it's, and this is a very fundamental part of us evolutionarily, like, um, all mammals have a vagus nerve. Uh, it regulates our breathing and our digestion. So it's been part of us through the whole evolutionary process. Well, our vagus nerve also becomes activated when it sees somebody, when we see someone else experiencing distress. Um, and that's kind of an amazing finding because it's showing that, that the same part of our bodies that helps us breathe also reacts when we see other people in sorrow. And, and so it's a, it's, it's a bonding mechanism. And like this one study of, um, of an organization called Midwest Billings, um, Midwest Billings was a a company where their job, the whole thing that they do is collect unpaid bills from people who have been in the hospital. So no one likes this job. It's not a fun job. Um, the turnover in this industry is sky high because no one wants to do it. But at Midwest Billings, they had created this culture where it was just part of what people did to help each other out when they were having trouble. 
whether the trouble was domestic violence or the common cold, like people would rally to support each other. And as a result, they had a turnover of only 2% and they got their bills collected. Like it was something like twice as fast as their mm -hmm. competitors in the industry. Cause there's something about working in that kind of environment that really lifts people up. So that's what I mean when I say, you know, if we could wish sorrow away, we would, but given that sorrow is here, right. It's also a pathway to connection. So we are nearing the end of our time and which I cannot help myself, but to use this as a segue into the last question that I want to um, get to. I, I don't see any questions in our chat. So I'm going to go ahead and plow into this one, which is um, a good portion of your book and particularly the third section is about impermanence and mortality. Mm -hmm. And it is about the fact that we carry with us from the day of our birth, um, an assurance of death. Mm -hmm. And um, it's, it's a wide ranging section that I was really intrigued by um, your experience investigating the um, immortalists, I think, or immortalism yeah. and people who are um, rallying around the idea of that if we, if we knew we would never die, we would actually be better people because that fear of death and perhaps that, that clinging to your piece of the pie and, and all of your concerns would sort of go away and we would become more altruistic. But you counter that with um, actually, it is the knowledge of our death and it is the acceptance of impermanence as being that which makes us human, but also um, opens us up to um, feeling a need to make the most of the time that we have. And I'm wondering um, if you can, you can share with us um, how that investigation into death is not something that we should shy away from in this book or, or in fact, talking with one another about it as a culture um, can really help us in alleviating a lot of the um, stress and conflict that we have. Yeah. I, oh my God. <laughs> so this is such a big topic um, to talk about in just a few minutes. But, um, <laughs> no pressure no at all. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. So I'm trying to think of where to start. It's very complicated. Um, the people who I call the, the immortalists, there are many words, you know, longevity advocates or whatever it is. I, I find them incredibly fascinating. And in the book, I describe having attended one of their conferences. And, and these are basically scientists and other people who are working to extend our human health spans and lifespans as long as we possibly can, you know, to the point ultimately of immortality. And it's a really interesting question, you know, putting aside the question of if and when we could ever really get there. Mm -hmm. um, the question of, do we want this or not? Right. Um, you know, and one of them put to me this incredible, incredible thought experiment of like, okay, well, yeah. and the thought experiment is, is meant for people who are skeptical about their project. And the experiment goes like, okay, ask yourself, do you want to die tomorrow? Well, probably not. Um, would you want to die the day after tomorrow or the day after that, or the day after that, like if, if, if given the choice. And it turns out it's, it's really very hard to say that there's ever a day that you would want to push that button, um, which, which suggests that we, we, all, all. we all might like to be immortal or right. you know, to extend it out forever or extend it out as, to some kind of asymptote of forever. And what does that tell us? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer to that, but I guess what I end up thinking is Number one, that's not the world we have right now. And in the world that we have right now, where mortality is a real thing, um, this, this knowledge of our fragility um, does turn out to be one of our pathways to wisdom. Um, mm -hmm. And there have, been, there, there have been really fascinating studies showing that 
the more people know that their days are numbered and and are really like aware in a visceral way of that fragility, um, that the more they live their lives with meaning and invest in their deep relationships and feel a deeper sense of gratitude and awe and like the, these states that most of us would want to inhabit all the time seem to be more readily available when we're acutely aware of life's fragility. And, uh, and, I, and so I think there's a way to hold all these truths at the same time. Um, like the Stoic philosophers thousands of years ago were teaching us to practice what they called memento mori, which meant to always remember death. And we hear that in contemporary culture and think that's m morbid, but it's exactly the opposite. It's like the more you realize we may not be here tomorrow, we have no idea. The more you realize that, the more you're living life with, with this intense awareness of its preciousness and, and beauty. And like, you know, every time for me, I was, I was encountering these ideas during a time when my, my sons were pretty little still and I was putting them to bed every night um you know and instead of and, and and the more I the more I had these ideas in mind the less I wanted to check my phone during those bedtimes and the more I was like oh my gosh you know this is like insanely great and I'm just going to be in this moment um and why would I distract myself with you know with this um, <laughs> so those are just some ideas, but there's so much more to say, but, but that's, th those are some ideas about how to think about mortality. And I think, um, as much as I have, I can't add to, um, that beautiful and meaningful, um, sentiment, I think that what that does show us is that, um, living our most full and sensitive and aware and engaged life comes from um, when we connect the bitter and the sweet because one reflects the other and that is ultimately our most clear vision when we can see um, all that being human actually is and that is what the gift of your book um, teaches us. And we are very grateful for this act of creativity that you've put into the world. Well, I am so grateful for you having me here today and Sally for like taking the time to think about and formulate and ask such deep and thoughtful questions. Um, not every interview is like that. And I know how much work and heart goes into that. So I really want to thank you for that. Um, and to thank anybody who's listening today. And um, yeah, it's just lovely to be here with you. It is my pleasure. We should note, thank you, Sally, you really do an amazing job. And mm -hmm. it's doesn't, it only does justice to this amazing book. So which I believe is showing backwards, another thing. <laughs> but it's, <laughs> don't worry, the copy that you get from either Porchlight or Boswell will not be backwards. It won't be. And um, we do actually also have um, tip and sign copies, which is really exciting too. So, um, and we'll be sending everybody a recording afterwards. So thank you, Susan Kane. Thank you, Sally Halverson. And thank thanks you. for everyone for joining us. We wouldn't have thank you. two bookstores without you. Have a great thank day, you everyone. So much. Have a thank wonderful you. day. Thank you.